Howdy, folks. Welcome to another Road Reflection. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, thank you for joining me today. If you are joining me at the, the moment that this is put up, or not. I mean, I'm not live streaming right now. Uh, that happens on Fridays. Every Friday I will be live streaming on all the channels. YouTube, Facebook, Rockfin. Those are the three primary places where I put up videos. Um, so if you're, if you're on those platforms and you check out my channel, be sure to join the live stream on Fridays. Uh, I might try to do a few more throughout the week pending, um, time. Uh, and while we're doing announcements, uh, so Friday's live streams, I, I, I try to get them, uh, I try to do the live streams around noon. Sometimes I miss the mark. Uh, I'm trying to find a good time for me to be able to do these streams and I just, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have like a consistent time, uh, which I know it's not awesome. It's not great. I should try to do them around noon. Um, because then people will know when to come to check it out. I'm going to aim for noon, but anyway, uh, point, uh, of order number two is that the live virtual stand-up comedy shows are coming back in January. Working on getting those ticket links up. I'll be doing two, uh, two of them in a month. I was trying to do three, but it still, you know, is quite a bit, especially when I'm writing a new show every week. Uh, it's a lot of work to do that, doing the research, doing the presentation, putting it all together, that sort of stuff. Uh, so I'm down to two and the way I'm going to work it out to make sure that I don't overwhelm myself, um, is, uh, I'm going to do one on kind of like a forkful, like the videos that I release on Mondays, uh, they'll be in front of a live virtual audience. You can get tickets and support the show that way. Um, there's probably going to be a bunch of you that are going to get free tickets uh, so if, if I have personally talked to you or, or you did try to buy a ticket to one of the canceled shows, uh, just know you have a free ticket and I'll give you like a code and stuff that you can put in. Um, so one of them will be the Forkful Live, uh, virtual and live. And then, uh, the other one's going to be a stories from the road where I could tell you guys like two, maybe three road stories in, uh, in the span of a show. They'll range anywhere between, um an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the stories, depending on, uh, time and stuff. And then we'll do the usual where I chat with you guys after the show. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we have any a Q and a session essentially. So based on, on the stories and sometimes we just, we don't have any questions and that's fine if you don't have any questions for that time. But, uh, you know, that's, that's something we're doing. So that's coming back in January, which is very exciting. Um, I am, I'm happy to do those shows again. I just got to do them at, at a, at a pace that works, um, and doesn't burn me out. Um, other than that, uh, as far as the check-ins go, uh, things are okay on my end. I've, I've just fallen, uh, rather behind. And so I had to take a day or two to play full catch up. On everything, kind of had a little bit of a, a lazy weekend. Needed a lazy weekend to just kind of lounge and um, relax. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I feel like every a lot of people are in a in a somewhat of a depressive funk uh, right now, just with the state of things. Uh, you know. Like Pennsylvania has gone back into full lockdown mode and that's fine because I think we need it. Um, you know, uh, on top of holiday stress, this time of year is always kind of particularly stressful. Uh, you know, I, w- I want to do kind of like a, a year end review like I usually do every year soon. I want to do I want to do one of those where I'll essentially talk about the first three months of touring um, it'll be good cause it'll be a nice memory exercise essentially. Uh, and 
Uh, but, you know, I would be touring around this time. I'd be wrapping up touring around this time. Uh, and I'm not doing that. And it's kind of a bummer. So it's bumming me. <laughs> I think I think it finally hit me, like, towards the fall, you know. Uh, and and I, I've, I've been kind of fighting the... Uh, the existential dread, as it were, and trying to be optimistic and, and remind myself that there are still good things going on and um, try try my best to enjoy said good things. So, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a challenge when you are in a depressive funk. Um, anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's get right into the, the topics at hand here. Uh, I, I got some important stories once again these are stories that usually don't get covered by corporate media or if they get covered by corporate media the the stories are uh, rather propagandized um, or smeared or they're covered in a pretty biased way uh, so what we try to do I you know I rant about a bunch of stuff uh, in these video series here in the road reflection series um, and sometimes the, the subject matter and the stories that we talk about wind up being a full forkful episodes or full episodes of The Dispatch, or I talk about them in my other podcasts as well. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing here today. Uh, first and foremost, let's get into this story. Um, pointed out, this, this was pointed out to me by uh, my good friend Rolf, runs the Louisville Proactivist Report. Shout out to Rolf. Uh, miss that dude I used to be able to go see I, I was you know every time I'd go through Louisville he he would come out and check out the show and uh, he's a, a fantastic independent journalist and activist uh, doing good stuff on the ground covering a lot of the protests covering a lot of the uh, direct action in Louisville Kentucky and um, a couple weeks ago maybe it was two weeks ago I came at you guys with a story about um, you know, the, um, the, the murder of Travis Nagd, uh, who was a prominent Black Lives Matter activist and his, his homicide was, the cops were like, they, we don't know who did it. It was a carjacking, something happened and, uh, we're at a bust. So what abs? <laughs> We'll see you later, uh, you know, and and then and then kind of just bailed on uh, on the whole thing, which was which is a huge bummer. Um, so we have another major activist, a Black Lives Matter activist in uh, in Louisville that was uh, that was killed, that was shot. Uh, both both Travis and this gentleman, Chris Smith, was shot. Uh, this is a second major activist in the Louisville area, um, and once again, you know, we, we have the cops kind of playing aloof in this situation, um, Chris Smith's wife went down with the local pastor and identified the body and saying that, yes, this is Chris Smith, he's been shot, he's been killed, which is incredibly unfortunate, uh, and my heart goes out to his family, to all of the, uh, all of the activists in Louisville, um, you know, it, it's, especially when you lose someone that is, um, that's in the movement and, and, and as, and as, uh, a big of a personality in the movement as, as these two gentlemen were, uh, from my understanding, you know, it, it does, it's, it's difficult not to see this as some kind of a, you know, warning kind of, kind of thing. Now, the the police department and the coroner's office, as of uh, the you know me making this video, uh, have not come out to say that it was in fact Chris Smith. They have not. They haven't identified the body, which is peculiar to me, and makes me question why. Why why haven't they come out and said uh, who this person is, and you know what what groups they were affiliated with when his wife has when a when a, a a pastor in the community has come out and you know said exactly who this person is uh why why is it that the coroner's office and the you know the police department is unwilling to say 
is it because he is an activist? Is it because he is a prominent figure uh, in the local organizing scene? You know, it, it you you have to ask those questions. Uh, it's very peculiar, especially when when the wife of the deceased, as it were, uh, uh, you know, to use the more stoic, sterile language. Uh, because you're not allowed to show any emotion when you talk about any sort of issues. Because if you get angry, oh, they label you as angry, and now whatever you say is invalid because it's tinged with emotion. Oh, how dare you have emotions about the death of an important, you know, uh, local leader of a movement. But if if the if the wife of the deceased has been able to identify them, why haven't the cops, uh, you know... Why haven't the cops taken the word of Chris Smith's wife and said, yes, we're, you know, confirmed? It's very strange. Now, the cops have also come out and they did this with, they did this with, they did this with Travis as well. Pardon the uh, stumble there. Um... There's no relation to Travis Nagdy's death, but primarily the big thing is they don't have enough evidence to figure out who did it. They don't have enough evidence to, 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 to figure out this homicide. Um, and, you know, all, all, the, the coverage comes from the Louisville Courier, and they talk about how, oh, there's this, this wave of homicides going on in the city of Louisville right now. You know, this is the hundred-some-odd homicide that, that the city of Louisville is seeing, so... You know, it's par for the course rather than asking, well, wait a minute, where is this wave of homicides coming from? What's going on? It, you know, is there socioeconomic problems that's creating a climate where, you know, these these homicides are are are, uh, are happening? You know, why isn't why aren't the cops able to solve this? Why aren't the cops able to go after this? You know, are, is aren't you supposed to look for evidence? Aren't you supposed to? To be able to find this stuff or check down, track down leads, uh, question the people in the local movements, find out if he has any enemies. And if you ask those questions, you'll find out that the enemies are probably the Louisville Metro Police Department. They're the ones that have been the point of aggression to the protesters, to the people in these movements. Can't you go off of bullet analysis? Didn't you? If he was shot, isn't there going to be bullets somewhere? Why can't you look at that? Isn't that a lead? Isn't that evidence? And again, the 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 reason why something like that uh, would not be addressed by the cops is if, in fact, the cops were responsible for it. I'm not saying they are, but we can make a conjecture. This is two major leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement that have been gunned down in a matter of two weeks. And... They're identical in the way that the police have responded to them. Oh, there isn't enough evidence for us to run a case. Uh, Carjackings happen all the time. Um, So on and so forth. Uh, And again, corporate media has stayed relatively silent. Uh, Like I said, the information I got is from someone that's on the ground, and they were finally able to send me, you know, a local paper covering uh, uh, what happened. And, And here's the other thing, right? The Louisville Courier spent a large amount of times outlining Chris Smith's past criminal activity. Which, to me, are just proof of socioeconomic status and the connection to criminal activity. When you are, you know, put into a very, very um, low-income socioeconomic status, uh, meaning poverty, when when you're impoverished, you have to come up with creative ways to put food on your family's table. And you and that's it. It's all about survival. And sometimes that survival doesn't come from having two or three jobs because 
you might not be able to get hired at two or three jobs or the jobs that you might get, you know, conflict with the other job that you do have, a litany of other reasons. So you turn to crime. You turn to a quick way to turn a buck so you can, you know, buy groceries uh, and put food on your family's table. There, there, there's no, there's no human story behind any of these criminal uh, activities, right? They're just like, this guy did bad things and he got sent to prison, so he's a bad man. And the thing with Chris, too, is he did do an interview where he talked to the press and he talked about his criminal past, uh, his, his record. And he said, yeah, it sucked that I had to go through that. And, you know, uh, what I was really looking for uh, was purpose and a sense of family. And I found that within the Black Lives Matter movement. I found that within the activist movement. People started taking care of each other. There's this notion of being on the streets, right? And and when you're when you're in that position, you're you're kind of competing for limited resources such as food and water, which is which all of the uh, the limits on the resources are all fucking manufactured anyway. The, the the scarcity is really manufactured to keep us fucking fighting each other, and and that's what it was. No one was really taking care of each other, but within the activist community, within the organizing community, that's what they were doing. And he was helping take care of uh, those within the movement. Not just that, too, but he was also um, uh, helping at-risk youth, right? That's the term, at-risk. They're at risk of criminal behavior because they are in poverty. And once again, the cycle continues, right? It's the same cycle that Chris Smith was caught in. But he was educating them. He took the education route. And was trying to help these kids. They spent probably three paragraphs outlining this guy's criminal record. And roughly one paragraph talking about his uh, community outreach, his activism, the way that he helps kids. So what do people kind of associate that with is that this guy is more of a criminal than he is someone that got his life in order and ensured that kids don't have to go down the same path you could have essentially written that this guy's had trouble in his past he went to prison a couple times got out decided he wanted to do something better found activism and and found a way to help kids using education and here's what here's what some of the kids have to say and here's what some of the activists have to say but they didn't. They concentrated on his criminal behavior. Because, again, the, the idea is that if you are somebody, uh, if you are a person of color, the media is going to portray you as some kind of criminal. Especially when you have been killed. To justify that the death is okay. That we don't need to feel bad about this person's death. They were a criminal anyway. And they don't address the the reasons why people commit crimes. They don't address the reasons why someone might have to sell drugs in his neighborhood. Why is there why is there an open window for drug trafficking in poor neighborhoods? Gee, I wonder if that has to do with a systemic problem that capitalism has manufactured. And once again, we are seeing another activist whose murder is not being investigated. Keep your eye on these things. If you got friends in Louisville, uh, and again, I'm not really seeing a lot of people talking about this. Uh, It's peculiar to me that two major leaders of this movement in the city of Louisville where you had a grand jury that fucking basically let three murderous cops go with a bullshit charge of, well, you fired at the door and you really should have hit that other black person. And because you didn't, we're going to give you the, you know, we're, we're going to charge you with the crime of shooting at a door. You're damn right people are pissed and people have every right to be pissed. And you have two leaders of that movement 
that have now been gunned down and the cops are basically saying we're not going to investigate because evidence it, we don't have enough evidence isn't that why we overfund the police is for this specific reason because we're all fucking scared and terrified that there's crime everywhere all the time and now the overfunded fucking police department in Louisville can't solve a murder the one thing that they're supposed to fucking do that they're supposed to protect people and keep people safe and serve the public and they can't fucking do that right now the leader of a movement is gone and you basically say there's not enough evidence to go on that you that, well, why the fuck are we funding you that much absolute nonsense they're not investigating it my conjecture is because it's a black lives matter activist is because this activist called for defunding the police I get it. It's a conjecture right now. There's a spike in homicides and the cops can't do anything about it. But we still need to give them tanks and drones and a flamethrower, a sound cannon, a TIE fighter, fucking a Borg cube. We got to get them all of those things. A decommissioned Borg cube. We're not going to give them with the fucking Borg in it. That's crazy. We're going to decommission the Borg cube. But they can't solve two murders. That happened back to back. Of two people within the same group. Two leaders of this of a movement. What if we did that with MLK? I mean, we did. Major leader movements, when they get assassinated, you know, it gets pinned on somebody and then the case is closed. The police went into fucking Fred Hampton's home and blasted, showered that fucking apartment with bullets over, over a lie told by the FBI. And there were cops that quit the Chicago police force because of that. Ask yourselves why the Louisville Police Department, the Louisville Homicide Department, isn't uh, fucking looking for who did this. Why are they closing the cases? Why is this not getting enough attention? Ask yourselves that question. Conjecture will lead to this the same kind of conclusion that I did. All right, uh, moving forward, uh, the Twitter sphere is a buzzin'. It is a buzzin'. Why is it buzzin'? Uh, over healthcare and over what Jimmy Dore has proposed uh, to do to get Medicare for all up for a vote in the House of Representatives. And I particularly think that this is a fantastic idea. I support it. I've been tweeting about it. Uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen uh, a bunch of tweets from me in response to a variety of progressive Democrats that are in the House of Representatives, um, you know, basically pushing what Jimmy's been pushing. Uh, and here's the deal. So uh, there, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Dore, uh, you know, I, I like Jimmy. I, I, I've gotten an opportunity to meet Jimmy once when Lee Camp was on a, a panel in Baltimore. I got to go down there and then I got to go hang out with Lee and Steph and uh, uh, Jimmy and Nick Barana and Tim Black and everybody. And it was, uh, it was a really fun time. Um, they're super courteous, incredibly nice guy. Uh, I, I got to talk to him for a brief moment. F incredibly sweet dude. But, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy um, has this idea. He points out in a video that there are 15 progressives right now uh, in the House of Representatives. A couple of them just got elected, right? You got AOC, you got Ro Khanna, uh, Pramila Jayapal, Ayanna Presley, Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, um, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, 
I know I'm missing a bunch. Uh, but, you know, effectively the people that believe and ran on Medicare for All, right? That, that we need universal health care. That everybody deserves health care, not deserves the access to or the choice of or the right to, but just deserves health care, period. Nothing else to it. And they won. They won their seat. They got your vote from various different states, various different districts that they represent across the country. And, uh, and, they're, and they're all about to you know, nominate a uh, Speaker of the House, and they're going to choose Nancy Pelosi again. Uh, you guys know Nancy Pelosi, Sweet Nance, Ice Cream Nance, uh, M- Magnum Nance. That's a very specific reference. <laughs> Talenti Nance. Uh, what, what else is a rich ice cream? <laughs> Those are the only two I know. Magnums and Talentis. Those were those were treats for me. My mom will every so often get get the Magnum ice cream bars, uh, but they're expensive, and you only get four of them in a box, and they're like eighteen eighteen dollars. I don't know. But um, she's she's up again. You know, and, and these progressives who who recognize that Nancy Pelosi is uh, as responsible for the American people not getting health care and not getting UBI during a fucking pandemic, as responsible for that as Mitch McConnell, as Donald Trump is, they're still going to vote for her. The flagship issue that you guys ran on Medicare for all, universal health care, health care as a human right. This woman objectively opposes. Back in June, when everybody was advocating for a universal basic income, and Permala Jayapal was the only person out of the Progressive Caucus that had the fucking balls to go up to Nancy Pelosi and say, why won't you look at it? And Nancy Pelosi's response was basically, we'll never look at it. Stop bringing it up. We don't want to look at it. And Permala Jaipal buckled because there was nobody supporting her. There was nobody supporting this progressive. Nobody in the progressive caucus supported this fucking progressive issue. Now, you you don't have to be all in for universal basic income, but it's still more progressive than what we have now. <coughs> and there was only one fucking Democrat going, going against, you know, the party bosses, and the party bosses being Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And she got no support. So what's Jimmy's idea? This person that has denied people health care, that has denied people progressive, um, progressive platforms that we need, is once again uh, up for uh, speakership of the House. And she needs to, you know, so there's, uh, what's the number here? 222 Democrats, 209 Republicans, so she would win the, the House majority. What Jimmy Dore is saying is, these 15 progressives would essentially all they have to do is say they're not going to vote for Nancy Pelosi until she brings up Medicare for all to a vote in the House of Representatives. And then we have on record who votes for it and who doesn't. And then we also have on record that if it does pass, if let's say 80 fucking percent of the House of Representatives decides that, yes, passing universal health care, Medicare for all, is something that we need in this country right now. And that we should look at Pramila Jayapal's bill and, and, and vote on it and implement it. And then they don't do anything about it. Then we know, once again, that these people are just liars. And there's no need to have progressives within the Democratic Party. And that these progressives don't really care about anything but their careers. 
regardless of what happens, it goes on record. Now, there's a lot of people coming after Jimmy Dore about this. I'm, I'm not going to go into that. It's the usual suspects, and 100,000 people have done a video about who's going after Jimmy for what and the hypocrisies within uh, all of those people. That, that's, that's not particularly what I'm interested in. Um, but there are a lot of people uh, who, who didn't like Jimmy Dore that are, you know, that are supporting him at this point, which I think is also very interesting. There's a couple reasons why, you know, people like Nancy Pelosi, who is a hundred millionaire that ma- made all her money through, you know, uh, through, through the economic downturn of 2008, uh, she's one of the richest members of Congress. Why someone like that would not want a Medicare for all. Uh, first and foremost... There's an unemployment crisis going on right now. We're about to reach a depression. Uh, A lot of people are losing their jobs because of the pandemic. And uh, with that said, they're also losing their health care. Because health care is tied to your employment, which is an insane thing to do, uh, and because of at-will employment, because of uh, right-to-work states... uh, because of the anti-union laws, this this particularly makes the working class in America uh, a lot less powerful. Because if you go on strike, you lose your health care. And if your kid gets sick, if your family gets sick, then what are you going to do? Uh, so it's extortion. People lose their employment, they lose their health care. They go on strike, they lose their health care. It's extortion. Medicare for all, if it was universal health care, and so regardless of what happens, you are still covered by uh, some kind of health care that you can still go to the doctor. That means more people can strike without the worry of, you know, if they get sick, what am I going to do? It's, it's a concern that's relieved. Uh, And what do we really need in this country right now? A general strike. Not voting on Medicare for all. And even bringing it up for a vote. I mean, AOC pointed that out on Jimmy's show. Jimmy Dore's show, when she came on, is it won't even come up for a vote. It won't even come up for a vote. Well, Jimmy's idea now is to bring it up to a vote, and you have the power to do that. 72% of the country, a Fox News poll, a Fox News poll showed that 72% of the country wants universal health care, wants Medicare for all. The platform of Bernie Sanders, the platform that these people ran on and won their seats. They want it. People want it. It's just a logical idea. Fifteen Democrats hold the power right now. And, and you know, Ron, Jim, Ron Placone and, and, and Jimmy Dore both pointed out, why is it 15? Well, it's 222 Democrats to 209 Republicans. If you take 15 away, then, you know, the Republicans... Would, would then get the majority, right? So then so then everybody goes, oh, but do you want the speakership of the House to be Republican? Well, it's not about that. It's about getting on record who is for and is not for universal health care, something that almost three-quarters of the fucking country wants. We, we, they have the power to do this. They're just not implementing it. Last week, I talked about how 400 lawmakers globally globally wrote a fucking letter instead of just drafting up a global law. You could have made that law. You could have said that Jeff Bezos in every country were coordinating a, to basically make sure that you don't become the world's first trillionaire while your employees suffer. You're going to become a trillionaire, but you can't pay your employees a decent wage. You can't give your employees a, a, a decent paid lunch break, health care. 
paid vacation, maternity leave, but you're on your way to become a fucking trillionaire. 400 lawmakers could have fucking done that. And they didn't. They wrote him a fucking letter. A toothless action. A video that got throttled, by the way. YouTube shouldn't show that video to fucking anybody. Uh, And once again, the progressives in Congress have an option to put this up as a Sophie's Choice to Nancy Pelosi. Do you want your speakership to continue? If you do, bring it up for a vote and we'll see where things go. If you don't, then you don't get our votes and then you don't become the Speaker of the House. And that makes things a lot harder for fucking Joe Biden. Not really. Joe Biden's a Republican. He'll do fine with the Republican, you know, uh, Speaker of the House. It's a good plan. More people need to jump on board. More people need to come on board and, and, and uh, you know, tweet at their congressman, call them. Not even call just your congressman because you, your, your congressman might not be one of these progressives. Just call these progressives. Tell them, you're, tell them you're, you're from so-and-so state and what they do in the House of Representatives is going to directly affect them, especially when it means that they're not going to get a vote on health care. That affects everybody. So it doesn't matter whether Ro Khanna is your representative or not. It doesn't matter whether Permila Jaipal or uh, Ayanna Presley or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is your fucking representative or not. Just call them. Just tweet at them. Do something. Put the public pressure on them. This is what we're supposed to do to elected officials. They are public servants and they're not serving us. Henceforth, we have to fucking hold their feet to the fire. This is what the fucking Democrats said the entire time during the election. Well, don't call out the Dems. Don't call out that we need to beat Trump. Well, Trump is now defeated. Officially, as of yesterday, he got defeated. We have a Democrat that's going to be the president in January. Time to hold their fucking feet to the fire. And if, you're, if they're not willing to, then there is absolutely no point in having progressives within the Democratic Party. And the progressives need to leave the Democratic Party and either join the Green Party or join the movement for a People's Party. We have people like Nina Turner that have to run underneath the Democratic Party ticket because she doesn't have any other fucking choice right now. Because in order to be recognized in the state of Ohio, she can't run as a Green or a Libertarian. Because they have to, they don't have, they don't have enough ballot access because the duopoly fucking holds them back. This is the system in play. So for all the people that are sitting there going, oh, well, well, if Nancy Pelosi doesn't win, then the Republicans going to win. Yeah, well, then maybe there shouldn't be two parties at play here. Maybe there should be more parties at play. You see all the shit that this is, this is exposing? And even if they don't, even if they don't, that shows you who, whose side they're on. These progressives, if they don't fucking hold Nancy Pelosi's feet to the fire, then, they, then, then they've already shown you whose side they're on. They're not on the side of the people. They're on the side of, of the party bosses and the donors. They're on the side of the oligarchs. It shows you that America is not a representative democracy. It is through and through a fucking oligarchy. All right, uh, we're going to move to the, the final story uh, of the day here. Um, I want to talk about this because uh, it's important. A, a friend of mine, Jay Jackson, uh, led me to this story. I did, uh, dug in a little deep to figure out what the hell is actually going on. Um, Tulsi Gabbard came out with a, with an anti-trans bill, and for before everybody freaks out and goes, "Oh, it's not anti-trans, anti, it's not anti, it's it's we're looking at the science." All that shit's been debunked. It's anti-trans. It's an anti-trans bill, and it is a betrayal to the LGBTQ community, 
um, who she said she was an ally to, continued to be an ally to, and now has all of a sudden, two weeks before she's done with Congress, decided to put this bill forward. Uh, So the bill is a Title IX bill. It's a Title IX bill. What is Title IX? It essentially grants equality for women athletes to ensure that they can get scholarships and um, grants and things of that sort when it comes to sports, right? So, and, and from, uh, I'm not a Title IX expert by any means, uh, but a lot of it has to do with the money, and, lo- and uh, Title IX seems to be messy anyway. So, Tulsi's bill basically says that it'll take away funding for any schools that let trans women, uh, that's m- men who have transitioned to becoming women, trans women who are women uh if you if you have trans women as part of you know your athletics program you will not receive funding because uh we're going by the biological biological sex of the individual okay well their biological sex would be female so why would you get in the way of taking money and power from women using a uh, use, using something that is meant to empower women so that would be the first question so she has gone on uh, you know several times explaining her position but her position quite frankly is wrong and this is coming as someone who supported Tulsi I, I feel like that is no uh, no shock to a lot of people. I've talked about Tulsi. I have defended Tulsi when Tulsi needed to be defended. I've also criticized Tulsi when Tulsi needs to be criticized. <clears throat> and this is one of those moments uh, where Tulsi needs to be criticized because this is a Joe Rogan argument, right? Joe Rogan has made this argument on his show several times. And Look, it's fine, right? You can have a question. That, that, that is an important question to ask. What do we do about transgender folks when it comes to sports? Great question. <clears throat> let's figure it out, and let's find an inclusive answer. We're, we're dealing with something that, you know, uh, our society particularly has not addressed in a, in a great way, uh, or, or ever at all. Transgender people are going to play sports. How do we include them in that? The argument that Tulsi and the, you know, the big Joe Rogans of the world are making is, well, if it is a man that transitioned to be a woman, uh, they have an unfair advantage because uh, men have, you know, bigger, stronger, faster muscles and uh, more athletic prowess, which in and of itself becomes a sexist argument, right? Because isn't that isn't that the whole big thing of uh, of equality within sports? Wasn't there a battle of the sexes in the '80s uh, to to prove that men and women uh, have the same level of athletic prowess, regardless of gender, regardless of what is in between their legs? Isn't that the point? Or was that all just for show? Because you could sell merchandise. So Chelsea's using the science argument here. Which is also debunked, mind you. Popular science in the ACLU have debunked a science argument. Uh... From from this article, the the, the, the person that wrote this popular science article specifically uh, talks about uh, going through hormone therapy for about two years, two uh, or or more possibly. It's like two plus years or something like that. And when you go through hormone therapy, it changes your muscle structure, it changes your skeletal structure, it changes a bunch of stuff. So this notion that, you know, um, 
oh, the, the trans women, they're, you know, they're, they're post-pubescent muscles are going to be faster and stronger. And, you know, it's an, it's an unfair advantage um, is false. It's bunk because of hormone treatment, hormone therapy. And then, you know, and then the, the other side of the argument, which is, which you can't claim that this, is, this has anything to do with science because it's the same argument as, oh, the transgender people are going into the, into the bathrooms uh, to commit sexual assault, which has never fucking happened. And if it has happened, it's, it's some bigot that wants to prove that right. It's the same thing as like when people are, are like, oh, people are crossing state lines to vote twice in elections. And who was the one that did it? It was a fucking conservative Trump voter that got caught trying to do that. So it's these myths, and those aren't based in science. So now that you have the hormone therapy, right, that debunks your argument based on science, uh, you, don't, you, you, you only have the argument that's based in bigotry, which is, oh, men want to uh, dominate in sports, so they're going to say that they're transgender women and have to play in women's sports. What? What an insane... That's also not how that works. I have yet to hear of a case... Where... Someone... That is a man... Says they're trans... To play sports... And, and get scholarships and win grants and so on and so forth. I've yet to hear about that case. So to make the claim that this bill is protecting women because of something that is unsubstantiated is not scientific. That's not based in science, period. So she's wrong. So Tulsi Gabbard is wrong. That's, that's, I mean, it's been debunked. (laughs) And here's the thing is like, Tulsi's smart enough to know to talk about the hormone therapy. But she doesn't. She just brings up this Title IX. Oh, it's in respect to Title IX. It's in respect to Title IX. And to talk about it like this, in this way, it's she's bringing she's bringing up this argument, and kind of, she's kind of making transgender people like a performance enhancing drug. Like, oh, if you're if you're trans then you have an unfair advantage. It's like taking steroids. She's not talking like the, uh, about them, like they're people. She's talking about them. Like they're some kind of performance enhancing drug. Which Tulsi, that's not what allies do. This bill when when I read that this was happening, which is maybe two two or three days ago, or maybe maybe late last week, um, and then I followed up and I you know did my research and looked through it. What's really peculiar about this is that Tulsi Gabbard, despite her past. One, has come out and apologized. Two, has put forward anti-discriminatory LGBTQ bills and got them passed within the House. She has a 100% rating with the Human Rights Commission. Committee? Commission? The HRC is what it, you know. This pro-LGBTQ group. 100% rating. And then two weeks before she leaves... This is one of the bills she puts forward. And she makes this bogus claim of science. Why would someone do that? 
you know, they're, and you're co-sponsoring with the Republican, you know. And she's co-sponsored other bills with Republicans, by the way. Uh, the bill to pardon Snowden and Assange, co-sponsored by a Republican. The bill that just passed to decriminalize marijuana on a federal level, co-sponsored with Republicans. So that's not anything peculiar. What's peculiar is the discriminatory nature of this bill when, you, when you've apologized and put anti-discriminatory bills forward and champion them for years, for the years that you've been in Congress. And if you are making this claim for science, why not, instead of using science as a point of discrimination, use science as a point of inclusion? If the issue here really is Title IX, then how can we make Title IX be more inclusive to our trans brothers and sisters? And it's the focal point of Title IX itself. The focal point of Title IX, once again, comes down to money. Who is going to get this money? This ensures that trans kids are not going to get scholarships in uh, in a culture that's already just that's that's already made I mean it's already made things difficult for trans people why make things harder for them this bill ensures that they're not going to get any kind of scholarship any kind of grants uh, it treats them as second-class citizens. It treats them as less than. And I see people that are Tulsi stands that that will not criticize any of the things she says. That kind of look at this and they go, "Well, why not make a, a trans league? Because separate but equal doesn't really work. Because we tried separate but equal. It doesn't really work." And here's the reality, kids, is if the Trans League doesn't sell as much fucking Coca-Cola or Bud Light as, you know, the Men's League does, then there goes the Trans League. The second point is... You should really be questioning the education system here. What does it say about America that we have a system in place where the only way kids can afford an education is if they are above and beyond pushing them pushing their own physical limits and that's the only way that they can afford to go to college? I'm not sitting there I'm sitting here and, and, and trying to diminish kids that do get sports scholarships by no means but I'm saying if that's the only way that these kids can go to college then there is something wrong with the education system and within this context again why aren't trans kids eligible for the same kind of sports scholarships that any male or female, that a cisgendered male or female would be eligible for? Don't they deserve the same rights? This is not a safety argument, folks. This is a divisive argument. This is a discriminatory argument. And Tulsi Gabbard is wrong. 
She's wrong about this. She's been right on a lot of things. She's been right about the military industrial complex. She's been right on Assange. She's been right on the Patriot Act. I wasn't 100% on board with her health care plan, but I didn't mind it. Pretty similar to the Australian health care model. I didn't mind it. Seemed all right. She was right about, she was right on the money with um, paper ballots. But when it comes to this, she is dead fucking wrong. Look, you have a choice to make in, in situations like this. When you come out and you go, well, we have a, an issue that we haven't really contended with as a society uh, about a group of people that we are unsure about how to include in a particular topic. I'm being vague for the sake of being vague. You have a choice. Either you can be inclusive in your decision or you can be discriminatory in your decision. And Tulsi Gabbard has cho- chosen the latter. And I am honestly not sure why. And if people are going to sit there and say, oh, it's to vie for a position at Fox News, mm, it's doubtful. I don't know if Tulsi really wants to be a pundit of sorts. I don't, like Andrew Yang, that was kind of his thing, is that... Uh, that he, I think he wanted a CNN contract and he got a CNN contract. I don't know if Tulsi's really looking for a Fox News contract. Uh, I don't know if Tulsi's looking for any kind of a contract with corporate media, especially when corporate media is slammed her that hard. I don't know if she's really looking for anything to do with politics at this point. I honestly don't know what the fuck is up. It's peculiar, it's wrong, and, you know, the more she pushes for this bill and the more I hear her talk about it, this is gonna. This is gonna be the 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 nail in the head that makes you completely lose my support. I'm not for over supporting mascots anymore. Anyway, that's. I kind of once Bernie and Tulsi endorsed Joe Biden. I kind of looked at it and was like, I I'm, I think I'm done, kind of pushing for a candidate. I think I'm more gonna push for these ideas. But I was anti-war before Tulsi Gabbard's, before I supported Tulsi Gabbard. I supported Tulsi Gabbard because she was anti-war. And she still might be, and I still support that idea. But this is something I can't fucking get behind. And you have two weeks left in Congress. Is this the bill that you want to go out on? To be known as the anti-trans representative from Hawaii? It's a really weak move. And I got to tell you, as someone that has followed her career and defended her when she needed to be defended, uh, this is a huge slap in the face of a lot of her supporters, I think. Um, and 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 it hurts more people than it benefits. It hurts more people than it benefits. You were you were considered a progressive because you were against the establishment. Progressives don't put out discriminatory bills. The end of her career is going to be I mean, she's put out a litany of bills, but the bills that she's getting the most noise for is not for the the pardoning of Assange and Snowden. It's not for the decriminalization bill. It's going to be this anti-trans bill. If that's what she wants her legacy to be, then that's what her legacy is going to be. And it's super fucking disappointing. I 
I don't know why she's doing it. It's it's very strange, and it's not about science. Uh, if it is about economics, it's about discriminatory economics, uh, and it just kind of makes you look like a bigot in this situation. Uh, and if the choice comes down to supporting trans people over supporting Tulsi Gabbard, I'm going to choose trans people, man. I'm going to go people over politician any fucking day of the week. I got enough uh, trans friends who I know would be fucking heartbroken about this. And every single argument that you've made dehumanizes them. The science argument is debunked. You're basically treating them like a performance-enhancing drug. You're ensuring that they can't get financial assistance to go to college if they excel at a particular sport. And the best idea that's come out of the, the comment sections is a separate but equal fucking genre of sports that will be that that will make them look like a you know I apologize for for the crass language here but a sideshow that's what most of the country will look at them as a league for for just trans people would not be considered as ser- I mean look at the women's leagues of of sports I'm not a big sports guy but look at the like the, uh, the women's leagues of sport don't get enough national attention As the men's leagues do. There's already an inequality here. And instead of addressing the real inequality within sports, you are going after trans kids that want to try to fucking get a scholarship because they excel at sports and want to be who the fuck they actually are. I'm going to choose their fucking side over Tulsi Gabbard's on this any day of the week. And Tulsi is one motherfucking percent wrong in this. All right, um, I, I think I think we're gonna wrap it up here because I'm gonna start yelling even louder, <laughs> and I'll blow out the, the, the fucking microphone. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, thank you guys for watching this. Uh, if you enjoyed this content. Make sure you hit the like button, make sure you subscribe to my channel, and make sure you share this out. Um, Topics like this, not really talked about a whole lot in in corporate media, so I depend on you guys out there, the viewers, to to help support and get the word out. Um, Go to my website, uh, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, You can check out past videos that I've made, past episodes of both my podcast, Forkful of Noodles and Taboo Table Talk, as well as uh, my stand-up comedy albums, uh, which are available on Bandcamp. You can get the entire collection for a dollar. We're going through a pandemic, and I want to make sure that you guys, you know, if you you want my shit, you can get my shit. Uh, It's all available for a dollar. Well, it's pay what you want, but dollar is where it, you know, the price that I've put on it. Um... And if you want to make a donation uh, or become a sustaining member, make monthly contributions, you can do so on my website as well, krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. Again, uh, thank you guys so much. I'll be going live on Friday, uh, trying to go live on Friday around noon. Uh, So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, Keep your eyes peeled for Taboo Table Talk as well. I've got some pretty cool conversations lined up, some returning guests, some very uh, uh, awesome first-time guests uh, that I've got coming up as well. And uh, we're going to do Fork Full of Noodles virtual and live starting in January. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, after Christmas, there won't be any new Fork Full of Noodles until the new year. Uh, so I'll be kind of taking a hiatus. I'll probably put up a couple of videos. I'll put up some new stand-up stuff. I'll put up some new virtual storytelling stuff as well. Uh, so yeah, so stay tuned for that stuff. Uh, keep keep t- keep tuning into this channel. Oh, and if you're on Rockfin, go to rockfin.com slash If you're not, 
Uh, you can tip this channel if you enjoy the stuff that's coming out here. Again, uh, I have no corporate sponsors, no sponsors, period. I am wholeheartedly supported uh, by uh, any of the donations and sustaining members that you guys uh, that y you guys make. So uh, very much appreciate that. And uh, I am going to go and rest my voice for a little bit. And uh, I'll see you guys. I'll probably see you guys tomorrow. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you on the road. Bye.